Though I may not see what the future brings, I will watch and wait for the same.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to meet here today, allowing us to worship as a corporate body, as a community of believers, as your children. We honor you, Father, with our words, with now with our giving. But Father, most importantly, may we honor you with our lives. May we live this day with abandonment to only you, Father, and may these, these offerings that we give, be used with abandonment to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. to be able to worship Jesus Christ together uh, in the body of believers here this morning. So I want to welcome you to our service. Uh, it's just good to be able to gather as God's people and to sing praises. Amen? Amen. May the joy every week to be able to come in and do this. And so we're just so blessed to be able to do that. The windows are being opened up, so if it's a little bit warm, you can have a little cool breeze hopefully coming in. Uh, we do have a few announcements for you that I'd like to share. Uh, first, where's David? Where's David? Oh, you're up there. Okay. okay. Um, in your bulletin, you'll see that there's an a insert called A Door for the Word. And we had this last Sunday. 
But I want to make sure that you see that this Sunday, and of course we have some new people uh, here this Sunday that weren't here last Sunday. And this is a 14-day prayer challenge. David's up in the balcony. Can you speak down and just give a word on what this is and how we can be involved as a congregation? Right. Um, as we were um, getting ready for our missions conference, and as we were getting ready, um, we're looking for ways to get the congregation involved. And one of the best ways that you can be involved is be praying for our missionaries and for our conference. So we put this together real quick. It has a scripture, and then, um, but we're asking that you pray for 10 minutes on the scripture, you pray for 10 minutes for the missionaries, and then you pray for every day. So 30 minutes of prayer a day is what we're asking for. And we are just excited for what God is going to do for our conference and for our church and for his church. So uh, we ask you all to be involved with that. This is the best way you guys can be involved in ministry and in missions and Amen. So the very best way, really, as David shared, is prayer. And so this is a 14-week challenge. The elders of the church have all committed to praying each day for the needs. You can see it's starting today. So you're not too late. You got it. You're ready to go today. Uh, and you can read through the scripture passage. Uh, Ten minutes there. Ten minutes praying uh, through the prayer request. Ten minutes uh, for the mission conference. Or however the Lord lays on your heart. But we want to be just daily in prayer. The time is not as essential as that we're daily in prayer in the word and in prayer. And so if you would commit with us to be able to do that, we just know that God is going to honor that and bless that. And we need to be in prayer for our mission conference. We're going to be having Rick and Marilyn Perhai come, who are our missionaries to the Ukraine. And so Rick will be sharing uh, for that Sunday morning. And they've been doing, obviously, they're not in Ukraine right now, but they've been doing a lot of different ministry with the refugees going into Poland and all sorts of uh, different things. And so... Uh, it would be very important for us to be able to hear about what God's doing in the Ukraine, all the miracles and different things that are happening, and really uh, what, how God's going to lead them in the future. Of course, they we just take a step at a time. But uh, So that's going to be very, uh, very important. And then we're going to have downstairs all the different booths set up, just like what we did last year. And, and we'll have food, and we're going to have information about all the different missions that we support. It's a missions fair, really, downstairs after the service so that's october 2nd and uh you should be here because you will be you will be blessed and as a congregation this is your really best opportunity to get the full picture of the missions that are, are connected to our church and how we're partnering and how how you may partner as well so that's the first uh thing you want to mention you'll also see in your bulletin that there's a, a no proposal three and how many have heard about that proposal this, and the rest of you, you're going to hear now. This is very important. I'm going to ask, ask Pastor Pat to come up. Uh, our church sponsored a table for the Right to Life dinner, and the speaker came in and shared about this proposal and what it's going to mean for our state. And as a church, as God's people, this is the time to stand. And so, Pat, if you will share just uh, about this proposal. Yeah, it was nice to be able to go to the dinner, uh, not just to fellowship with other people from the church, but to hear what's going on in the state. And a lot of this is going to be directed towards this group of people right here, my peers, my generation, who a lot of us pay no attention to what's going on in the world. Not saying it's all you guys. Maybe you do. Uh, but man, my generation just doesn't care uh, more and more, it seems. Um, but uh, yeah, Proposal 3 will be on the ballot on November 8th after Roe versus Wade went overturned. The radicals went out and got enough signatures to...
anybody. So if a young man gets a young woman pregnant, not only does he persuade her to participate in that act with her, now he can persuade her to go get the abortion and there would be no legal ramifications uh, for parental consent. This also includes things like gender reassignment things, sterilization. Um, if there's a teacher out there that has a 12-year-old girl that thinks she's a boy, he, can, he or she can go get that young girl sterilized without her parents knowing, free of legal ramifications. You won't read that in the, in the, um, the surface level of the text of this bill. You have to read deeper, um, but it's all in there. And that's why they make it confusing because they know people won't read it, right? Um, so go vote no on November 8th. You can do it, and we, we need to do it. And tell your friends, honestly. Tell people, like I said, especially us, guys. We have friends that probably aren't even registered to vote. Um, and so get people registered to vote, or else really it could be really the end of all the pro-life advancements that have been made. So it's a huge deal. So get out and vote. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, not a political issue. It's a biblical issue, and it's really a matter of life and death. And we, as God's people, need to rise to that occasion and defend life in our state. And so uh, if you have any other questions or anything, please uh, come and see anyone who went to that dinner or uh, uh, Pastor Pat or myself, and we'd certainly love to be able to share more with you on that. Yes? Do we know the deadline for registering to vote if the person needs to register for, to vote for the first time? Do you know the date of that? Does anybody know that? I don't, but I'm just saying that you can find out because it's probably pretty mm -hmm. soon. Uh, tomorrow. Go tomorrow. <laughs> uh, it, it really is that important. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so you, okay, you can saying you can register that day, but the sooner the better, and let's let's make a stand for life. Uh, as a church, we're we must we must do so. Amen. All right. Are there any other announcements? All right. This time, then we're gonna have our scripture reader come forward, and uh, we're gonna have our little ones go down to nursery. So five and under. For nursery, following Miss Julie, uh, heading down, and we're going to be starting a new series today. We're looking at the armor of God this Sunday and talking about, talking about a war and a battle. There's one that's going on, and if you aren't aware of that, we need to be aware of that. And so we're going to be studying the armor of God through our house-to-house -house times for all those weeks, the eight weeks, looking at the armor of God um, from Ephesians chapter 6. So in your Bibles, go ahead and open those up. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to read 10 through 20. Please stand for the reading of the word, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Good morning, everyone. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish in all flames darts of evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Amen, amen, you may be seated. Father, we do pray that your blessing be added. We know that it does not go away. We know that your word has the power to change hearts and lives, uh, to bring about uh, true change, inward change. And so we just ask, Lord, as your word is proclaimed, that we would have uh, uh, listening ears with faith, Lord, to believe and to trust your word. Help us to trust and obey. And uh, we know, Lord, that 
uh, when we do, that, that you bring uh, great joy and peace and, and victory uh, through our lives and in our church. And so we just ask for your blessing on all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've uh, shared already here, there's a battle that's being fought in America, and it's a deadly war. You may ask, is our country at war? And the truth is that we are. It's a spiritual war. It's a war between light and dark, good and evil, heaven and hell. And you are part of that war. I want to share with you that we cannot be ignorant of that and we cannot be neutral in that. And those are the two tendencies that people can have. We're just not aware of it. We're not interested in that. Or I'm just going to be neutral and on the sidelines. But you, Christian, do not have that option to be neutral in this. That's why we're going to share looking at the armor of God. This week, uh, well, we're going to take it piece by piece. As Bible says, to put on, on the whole armor. So we're going to look at each piece of that armor and how it relates to our Christian life as the weeks go on. This week, we're just setting things up, looking at the reality of that war, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities. So we're going to look at that. It's a spiritual war. I can give you three points. I know sometimes it's not recommended to give your points right away because then you'll tune out, but I'm going to trust that you're not going to tune out and that you're going to listen even though I'm giving you my points right at the beginning. So the first one is that there is a spiritual war. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, it is true. And if you're not aware of that, we need to be aware of that. Number two is that there's a call to battle or a call to arms. That we have a place in that war and we need to take our place. And number three is that there is a victory that will be won. There's a declaration the victory has already been won. And so we can, we can take confidence in Christ. And we must do that. So those are my three points. I'm going to trust you're going to still listen through as we, as we work through this. So in the scriptures, in verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. In verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of of the devil. Now, in our country, the devil is someone that is uh, a, a laughable thing, if you will, for many people, and something that is mocked or ridiculed. Uh, we even have sports teams named the Devils. Even some of our local high schools are called the Devils, and it's just something that's uh, considered really almost comical in that way. We have food named Devils, like Devil's food cake. I mean, like that. It's it's devil eggs. Devil hand, right? So we have all these different things, and we don't even think about it because it's just, it's just something that's a part of the culture, but it's not speaking the truth of who the devil is. And we have um, in, our, in our country, there's, uh, his purposes are, are veiled, if you will. And C.S. Lewis has said this, that we either make the two errors, we either make too much of him or we make too little of him. And probably... For most of us, it may be that we make too little of him. But we have an enemy who is very real, and we need to understand that. If we think that there is no enemy, then we will not be prepared for war. And that's why this is so important. The word devil, it means uh, to accuse. The Latin is diabolus, and it, we reference Satan, the old serpent, the dragon, the accuser of the brethren. Go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 12. And we need to know our enemy. And the Bible has a lot to say about who our enemy is. If you look in Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 7, it says, Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels were fighting against the dragon. That's the devil, Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night. Before our God. So we learn a lot about Satan in these passages. First of all, he's not all knowing, he's not everywhere, he's not uh, all powerful. 
Uh, these are attributes really subscribed just to ascribe to God alone. But he does have a well-organized demonic army, and he is an accuser of the brethren both day and night before our God. The Bible says that he's the father of all lies, and he wants to destroy everything that reflects God. And who is made in the image and likeness of God? We are. So you better believe that he wants to destroy you. And not only you, but your marriage and your family and your church and everything else that we know that God, uh, that God has made. How many, when you became a Christian, all hell broke loose on your life? And this can happen, right? And you decide to take a mission trip. You decide you're going to get baptized. You're going to, which we have a baptism coming up. I forgot to mention that. Baptism next Sunday. Rex is going to be getting baptized. And so that will be at the state park at 2.30. Insert announcement right there. But, um, <laughs> baptism next Sunday. Be ready to come. We want to celebrate that. But one of the things we'll share is that, that that moment then when you take that stand for Jesus Christ, all hell can break loose in your life. Because you're making a stand now. Now, that, now you're not on his side. You're on the opposing side, on God's side. And, and he hates God. And he hates everything that God loves and values. And when we look at at the demonic attacks and things that are happening, everything is really an affront against God and what his word says. We look at the whole gender, the assault on gender, male and female. Where does that come from? Why is there so much opposition to that there is male and female? Because God said that he created them male and female. This is really the heart of the attack on gender is actually God, it's an attack on God himself and his word that he created them male and female. Why is there so much of a war against the unborn? Because the Bible says that that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Right? We're knit together in our mother's womb. Of course, the devil is going to go after the unborn. Why is there a war against marriage? Because the Bible says that he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains grace and favor from the Lord, that, that that marriage is something that is God designed and ordained and meant to be a blessing and a joy for those that are married. Of course, there's going to be a war against those things. We think, well, why is there so much opposition in the world? And, and we think, well, what is going to be next? And all we have to do is really is look through the Bible and we can say, well, what does God's word say? What does it say? And what has not been attacked yet? We can guarantee that it will be attacked one day, right? And so we think, well, why, what's going to happen next? When we know our Bibles, we know, well, everything basically that God values and loves and treasures and says is true and good and and beautiful and just and holy, all those things will be attacked. And so we know the schemes of the devil and what he is attempting to do. Where is all this opposition coming from? And theologians have said that it's from the world, the flesh, and the devil are the three categories, if you will. And we think about the world. This is the fallen system that resulted after the fall, Adam and Eve being kicked out of Eden. The Bible says to love not the world. Now, you know that for God so loved the world, right? But that's actually a different thing. God so loved the people in the world that he gave his only begotten son. But we're not to love the world, meaning the schemes and the systems of mankind that are in direct opposition to who God is. And we will either love the world and we will be infected by it. Or we will resist that because we live in a different kingdom. And this is the battle that's going on really between two different kingdoms. It's a clash of kingdoms and values. And we'll either be, we'll either be conformed to the world or we'll be transformed by the renewing of our mind, really setting it on Jesus Christ. So that's, there's opposition in the world. How many have seen that? Raise your hand if you've seen opposition in the world. All you have to do is turn on your TV, right? And there's opposition that we know that's coming from the world. The flesh is the other opposition that we face. And many, perhaps even most of the, of the challenges that we face, face are really from passions within us. Like James says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? We know that there's a battle even with the passions of the flesh that are within us. But the third category is the devil. We have the world, the flesh, and the devil. All these are in opposition against us. And we can think, well, why are all these things happening? And we must give room for that the devil is in operation in this world. And if you look at a deeper analysis of things, in fact, much of the suffering 
that the church faces is because of the rage of Satan. And this is something that we don't talk about as much, but that we need to be aware of. So why is he in a rage? If you look in Revelation chapter 12, or maybe you're still there, take a look at verse 10. We see then that the accuser of the brothers has been thrown down. And in verse 12, it says in the last part there, I'll read the whole verse. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth, and sea, for the devil has come down to you, which is on earth, down to us, in great wrath. Why is he in great wrath against you? And the reason is because he knows his time is short. If you remember, if you study history, uh, Hitler after Normandy, his time was, was essentially over. If you study the history of World War II, once the Allied forces landed on, on the beaches in Normandy, that, once they took that beachhead, if you study history, let me know what I'm talking about, that war was over. That was essentially over. However, things had, the battles had to be fought and things like that. But same, or Hitler, similar, uh, <laughs> true, actually. Uh, knew that his time was short. And he was going to, in great wrath, he was going to take as many down with him as he could. He knew he was going to go down himself, but he's going to take as many down with him. Same, same thing. He knows his time is short. He's going to take as many down with him as he can. Also, his sphere is really limited. He's cast down from heaven, and he's, he's now on earth, and which is... Not good news for us in a way, right? Because it's the place where we live and where we are. But this is his fear. And it's, it's limited by God in, in what he allows Satan to operate in. And we think, well, will he be successful? Or we could ask, is the world getting better or worse? Better or worse? Who says the world's getting better? Who says the world's getting worse? I'm going to say both. I'm going to throw that in. Okay, it's probably both in a way, right? Uh, when you look at Matthew 13, the wheat and the tares, they both grow up until the end. And so we have, there's in a sense, there's things that God's doing. The kingdom of God is growing and expanding. The gospel is going forth. There's really a lot of good news out there. But we also know then that Satan has uh, a certain level, a certain amount of power and authority in this world. And that he is uh, causing all sorts of war against us as Christians. And... And what did God say about the wheat and tares? Let both grow until the end. And then well, we see that the judgment of God will come. And one day, every knee, and knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So are things getting better? In a sense, they are. We're, all, we're, we're coming closer to, to Jesus' rule and reign over this world. But we also know then that, that there's growth that's happening in the kingdom of darkness as well. So... The answer is really both. Things are getting better and things are getting worse. But we see then that, that there is this spiritual war that is happening. And Satan is at rage and he has limited, limited power, limited sphere of influence that he has. And so we need to be aware of that. All right. So I said I was going to give you three points. My first point is that you're in a spiritual war. How many are aware of that? Spiritual war. We're, we're in one. Martin Luther, in his hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, he wrote, For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. What he's saying on that is that on our own, we are no match for Satan. If you're going to go up against Satan in your own strength, then you will not win. So it talks about the schemes of the devil or the wiles and that, that word in the Greek is methodoia which is where we get the word metho uh, methodical or method so Satan has a method or a strategy that he is using against us and what is that strategy well the devil is a liar right maybe you know that song the devil is a liar some of the younger people you guys should know that one the devil is a He's the liar, and we know then that he's the father of lies. Thomas Brooks, the Puritan preacher, said this. He presents to you the sweet, the pleasure, and the profit that may follow when you yield to sin. 
But he hides from you the, the wrath, the misery, and the pain that will follow. Anytime you are yielding to sin, you're only seeing the sweet, the pleasure, and the profit. But the devil is a liar, and he will hide the wrath, the misery, and the pain that will follow from that. And if you know what I'm talking about with that. And we can begin to think things, or that, that Satan can put things, demonic thoughts in our hearts, in our heads, that would say, well, one time, and no one will know, or what's so wrong with, you, with this, or God will forgive you anyway. But the Bible says to flee from temptation, right? And so the Satan is a liar, and he will hide things from you. He's also the accuser of the brethren. He will point out something that you did or didn't do, not so that you would repent, but that so you would be so uh, guilt-ridden in a way that, that you would not be able to go forward in, in, in the things that God has for you. And what we see then, then that he'll hide God's love and grace from us. And so we'll, he'll show us how we're unclean. And are we unclean in our sin? Yes, we are. Is that true? Yes, it is. But it's only half true. Because the part that is hidden from us then is really that Jesus died in our place. And he took the punishment of our sin that we deserve so that we can stand clean before God. And is Satan going to tell you that? So that you can walk in grace and victory? No, he won't. And so we can begin to believe things like lies. Like, why should I even go to church? I don't want to be a hypocrite. Maybe some of you have thought that. Or there's no hope for you. You've sinned too many times in this. Maybe Christianity is not for you. People can believe this or hear this. Well, where do you think these things are coming from? The accuser of the brethren wants to accuse us with half-truths. And a half-true is a lie. It's a lie, isn't it? He may even, another method of his is he may even allow you to take one step forward in order to go back, that you might go backward too. And we're thinking about this with the Roe v. Wade and, and perhaps a method, I'm not saying this is true, but perhaps a tactic could be something like this. I'm going to give you Roe v. Wade. This is from the Satan's perspective. I'm going to give that to you. But you'll be so complacent that things will actually be worse in the long run. Is that, could that be a scheme of the enemy? Yes. It could be. It could be. And he has a scheme and a plan to sabotage your life, your home, family, marriage, everything. Apart from the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that he could even deceive the elect. This is why Paul says to put on the armor of God. And this is what I'm, my goal for you is is that we would see that great need, that we're in a spiritual war, that we need to be arming ourselves, putting on that armor, knowing our enemy, but believing the things that are true. And this is the call to arms, that we're in this battle. We need to see it, recognize it, and participate in it. Some of you know uh, the Lord of the Rings. Another quote for you from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, Pippin, who's a hobbit, and uh, he's inspecting this armor, and a sword that had been given to him. Well, the hobbits are little weak creatures, They're kind of like men, but even uh, weaker in a sense, smaller. And, and he's been given, sorry guys, I'm totally botching the hobbit description, but uh, Pippin's this little hobbit, and he's inspecting he's this armor and sword he's been given. Now, hobbits don't fight, they're not warriors. They like to eat and have fun and, and that kind of thing. And he's given this armor and sword. And he says to his friend Gandalf, so I imagine this is just a ceremonial position. I mean, they don't actually expect me to do any fighting, do they? And Gandalf said, you're in the service of the steward now. You will have to do as you are told, Peregrine took. <laughs> and we think, well, here we're given, here's the armor of God. Here's the things that we're to be about. And we might ask, well, isn't that just ceremonial? Jesus, you don't really expect me to do any fighting or to be involved in a battle, do you? We say, I'd rather just have fun. I'd rather just have food or fourth breakfast or whatever. Uh, uh, I'd rather just live a life of entertainment. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a spiritual battle. But the hobbits played an important role in that battle, and we have a role to play as well. You're in the service, not of the steward, but you're in the service of the king. You will have to do as you are told. You cannot be ignorant of these things. So we, are, we have a call to battle. We have a call to be involved. We must be engaged in this. The third thing. So we, you're in a spiritual war. There's a call to battle. 
Third thing is that there is a victory. And this will be my, my closing point here. There is a victory with that. In fact, part of God's plan in this battle, we think, why is Satan even permitted to do anything? Because God will ultimately receive greater glory through this than if Satan had never even existed. And that's, that's an amazing thing to think about. But as we overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, not loving our lives to the end, we know that, that God will actually be great, greater glorified through that. Martin Luther and his hymn, a mighty fortress said, did we in our own strength confide that our striving would be losing in our own strength? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirits and the gift are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindreds go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. One little word shall fell him. What is that word? It is the word, the capital W word, Jesus. The Bible says in John 12, 31, now it is the judgment of this, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Speaking of Satan, in 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who is in the world? Satan, right? Who is in you? Jesus. You may have seen on the on social media, there's a, a picture where it has like an arm wrestling match between uh, Jesus and Satan. Has anybody seen that picture? A few of you have. That's so bad. It's not, this is not an equal battle of two Two titans clashing. This is one, in fact, Jesus says, his very breath actually will dis destroy the forces of darkness when he returns. This is not a, a, a clash of, of equals in any sense. One little word shall fell him, that word Jesus Christ, greater is he that's in you. We do not have to be afraid. Ephesians 6.10 says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Paul understands where the battle is one. If you look at verses uh, th 13 and 14 in, Eph in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the, the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Verse 14, stand therefore. And then we go into the description of the armor of God. And I, in my Bible, I underlined stand three times here. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore. Notice he doesn't say that you are to now go conquer. Now go conquer. He doesn't say that. All he does is say to stand. How many can stand? You can do that, right? And you're standing firm in, in the victory that Jesus has already won. So you may ask, if Satan is defeated, then why... Do I have to be warned? Why are, you even, why are we even discussing this? And because God still allows Satan to have some power on this earth. How many know that if you cut off the head of a rattlesnake, that up for an hour later, it can still bite you? Anybody ever experienced that? <laughs> the next time you cut off the head of a rattlesnake. <laughs> Aren't you glad we don't live in the South? <laughs> You cut off the head of a rattlesnake. His head is severed from his body. And I watched a video of this, actually. It's true. <laughs> and it can still, it still, it can, act, there's an alarming amount, a surprising amount of uh, injuries that people have sustained from a severed rattlesnake head that has still bit them and caused them harm. And Satan is, is a defeated enemy. His head has been severed. He's been severed. He's a defeated foe. 
but he can still take you down. He's still biting, seeking whom he may devour. We need to be prepared for this. And Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. Don't leave one piece off. You put on the whole armor of God. We're going to go through each of those pieces, making sure that we're putting on the whole armor of God in the battle that, that we're in. Let me just give you three quick applications, and then uh, we'll send you on our way. The first thing is we must analyze our situation biblically. And we can think, well, why are, why are we in this situation? You think, well, there's a lot of humanistic reasons. There might even be other legitimate reasons. Well, it's the way I was raised. It's because of the political party that's in power. It's because of a chemical imbalance. We can say all these different things that are going on in the world. And so there may be some merit to those things. But at the end of the day, the devil has done this. And we need to recognize that. Number two, we need to use our weapons. And it's really involving a spirit-filled life. It has to be the dominant shaping force in your life. If the world, the flesh, or the accusations of the devil are the dominant shaping force in your life, then you will not escape. You will not resist the cosmic powers of this world, of the devil, of the flesh. And so is there space for the presence of Jesus in your life? That's going to be the key, really, for the victory. That has to be the dominant shaping force in our life um, in that. And number three, that we use these weapons as a family. Now you're in the service of the king, right? Does he expect you to fight? He does. How do you fight? You stand. That's how you fight. And we, we do this together. The, web, the armor of God is not given to just one individual, but to the church is given to. And that means that we're not alone in this. And we need to encourage one another. We need to grow in the Lord together. We need to carve out time for the Spirit to, to uh, unite us. And what happens then when we do that, the Satan does not have the victory in these things. Without that, though, something happens. We become irrita irritable, irritated at other people in the church. We become frustrated with things. All these things kind of happen, and the devil begins to have victory in, in our church. But when we come together and we allow the Holy Spirit then to unite us in the way of Christ, then, then we have victory in these things. I'm going to give you one more shameless plug for House to House, because uh, House to House is a way that we can grow and unite really as the body of Christ. And so if you have not signed up for house to house, there are some signups in the back there. And this, there's ways we need to be in fellowship and, and uh, growing together. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. We're going to invite our worship team if you'll come on up at this time. And the word says to stand, right? Now I want you to physically stand up. Stand up in the power of the might of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is how you fight. You fight by standing on, on the, the Word of God and what He says in your life is true. It's, it's sure and true. And then how do we wage war? We stand in His might, in His victory, through prayer and through living it out in fellowship and service with one another. So, Father, we just ask for your, your hand in, in our church, in our lives, Lord. As we share about the battle and the victory, help us not to be overcome or overwhelmed, but that, Lord, that we would rest on Jesus Christ. We thank you that greater is he that's in us, Lord, than he that's in the world. Help us to go forward with, with an understanding of, of the reality of, of the situation we're in, but, but a greater understanding of the presence and power of Jesus in our life. And we can rest on, have confidence, Lord, that, that you are the victor. Lord, thank you for winning the victory, for being willing to go to that cross, to be nailed, Lord, to that cross, but knowing, Lord, that through your suffering, through your death, your resurrection, that you have won for us the victory over sin, death, and hell, and Satan himself. So, Lord, let us walk in the ways of Jesus Christ together as a church family. Help us, Lord, to stand firm, knowing, Lord, that we have an enemy, but knowing that we have a Savior, a friend, a mighty King, in whom we are in service to. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I was going to tell you to stand. Um, <laughs> well, stand.
stand on the outside, but I uh, urge you to kneel on the inside while we worship our Lord for this last song. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, burn through the fiercest ground. to point out that we have Jessica here with us this morning and we should give her a hand clap. She did great. Okay, now you can go. 